starting soon screen or anything like that. So I'm just going to start when it's time to start. So, yeah. I think I'm seeing an ad. Yeah. Okay. There's the stream. Wait, why is this so weird? There we go. That's not. All right. Sweet. It's on. Discord. Discord which So at the top, there is a yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Gotta get the figurines out of the way. I mean actually this Oh, I was continuing to talk as I was I wonder if I shouldn't plug in the mic to this headset and give it a shot. Oh, you were hearing your talk. Yeah, I think once you turned away, it stopped picking you up. Oh, wow. So, am I audible right now? Yeah, because you're facing it, I think. Am I audible right now? Uh, you're becoming much less audible. I will keep that in mind. I heard that one, though. So... So I'm actually making this room doable to put more figures in because I'm wanting to get out of this room. Mm -hmm. Are the figures blocking the doorway? No, I mean, this project is, oh. is to store more Mountain Dew stuff and more figures, like the, the shelving on here. Um, for example, the reason why I'm moving all the figures I'm moving, not only just to get them out of the way, out of the frame, but, for example, this one is, uh, and this is going to, part of what makes this project interesting this one is going to go so here's a shelf already like here's a shelf right here that is attached to this board so you can't mm -hmm. even actually see the top of the board this is also nailed on or it's hanging on a couple screws i'm gonna have to remove it to get the power to it but this board is actually going to go right here and that's the first thing i'm going to be Gonna so, dangle off the side. Yeah, so it's gonna have it's gonna be mounted to the board, just like the one above. But then up here, the brace is actually gonna go behind one of these frames, and so it's gonna mount to the wall as well. And it's intentionally gonna be lower than this. It's gonna be enough room here to stick a figure or a bottle or something like that. Actually, let me test that right now, real quick. Uh, is there room? Twenty ounce bottle, or a twenty four ounce can, or sixteen ounce can. Tallest one first. No. Barely. Nice. Huh. 
but but the ones that are going to be hanging off like that might be primarily figures. Anyway. You've been playing a lot of different things lately. Oh. You know, it's funny is uh you know, I love my, my dead games, I guess. I don't know. Exactly. I've been pulled <laughs> I've been pulled back into hots. It's like, what the fuck? You're playing Heroes? Warframe? No, Warcraft? What the fuck are you doing? Oh, no. Yeah, are you even my... Wow. Are you even my... Are we even friends anymore? Right? No, no. The <laughs> WoW The wow is... Uh, I don't know. Like, so a couple other guys, you know, they, they, they've they been kind of like jumping around, dabbling in some other MMOs. Okay. And... um. You know, my wife and I, we, we're not really that interested in going into other MMOs too much. She especially. Like, she just doesn't have the time. And sure. the MMO she is in, you know, she's in all the way. Um, whereas I have a tiny bit more free time. I've been finding out, though, it's not as much as I sometimes think. And I think it's because I've just been playing less video games during the day as I had in the past. I've just been finding other things to stay busy with, house projects or just house chores. But right. um, I've actually been like that this past week in particular. Yeah. And like, I finally finished my stairs, though. Oh, they're done. They're done, done. Good. Like, it looks nice, too. Although, <laughs> one of the cats, I'm going off on a tangent now, but one of the cats, uh, yeah. they, they like to scratch the edge of the stairs, especially at the top. And um, now that that's not a thing, that, you know, they don't do it. They, they're not scratching the wood, so that's good. However, I do think that the cat is still like, they want to like you know they, they they like to sharpen their nails and we have a sharpening post for them like a scratching post for them that I know um at least two of the cats use but I think the one that liked the top of the stairs she she also likes to hang out outside of one of my son's rooms so like I think she's still just hanging out there and since she can't do this edge of the stairs she's just doing the carpet like near the edge of the carpet and she started to pull that carpet out from underneath the transition a little bit like. Such a punk. I'm going to have to probably pull that transition up just to get the carpet reseated underneath it again. So, um, I'm familiar with the layout of your place. Are we talking about the one that's at the top of the stairs? Yeah. Okay, so what about putting some sort of a dedicated scratching uh, piece of cat furniture there? We could. We might be able to do that. That would just put something up there, like right on, like, because there's that low wall, like right at the edge of that low wall or something, see if that would... A tractor. Uh, in the biz, we call that a pony wall. Pony wall. Yep. Okay, I haven't heard that. Before. But I'm not in the biz. What biz is this? <laughs> the. Uh, so uh, it's not. It can be mill work. It's not always mill work. But that's where I'm familiar with it from. And oh, gotcha. So it's just a little half wall that's meant to be a, a divider, sometimes decorative. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, that'd be a spot for the trash. Gotcha. But uh, I, we totally segued. Oh, the house chores. The, wow, wow. Um. But so they've been kind of dabbling into other MMOs and they're like, you should play with us. And it's like, well, I can maybe give it a little bit of a shot here. And it's like, I didn't subscribe to it because I knew it was probably unlikely I was going to really get into it and make a subscription worthwhile. I, I had tried in the past before because a different friend had been like, right before Dragonflight came out, he was like, oh, they're fixing so much. It's actually looking like it's going to be a good game. And so I tried it out then. And I, I'll admit, it's fine. Like, like, uh, I, I really like the aesthetic of the Demon Hunter class in WoW. It reminds me a ton of the Legacy of Kane games, like the Soul Reaver ones. Okay. Um, and I really love those. Like, those, uh, oh, man, I played those so much growing up. Like, um, well, I know I that. So I'm familiar with them. 17, 18. I, <laughs> I didn't play them, but only because, like, I, I never had a PlayStation. And, which is kind of odd because I have a Japanese one now. In 2023, mm. I got a Japanese PlayStation. But... The YouTube channel, channel Skill Up, um, a couple of gripes with his channel in general. He talks about it all the fucking time, which is fine. 
because everyone has those sort of pet games, you know, those, you know, childhood favorite type things. Yeah. So I'm familiar with it through him in that way. And he wants them rebooted. He uh, recently, whether it's Embracer Group or whoever else picked up the studio or has the rights to it, they recently mentioned it. So he's very happy what? about that. Wasn't it? Wasn't it like Square Enix picked them up? No, no, no. Square Enix has been selling stuff. They've been famously selling stuff. And so oh. they gave up rights to a number of things. And okay. so I don't know where that series is at the moment. I also, because I decided, look, I'm not going to go back and play these games. It's fine. Um, at getting to the point where I've realized that my game room that I, that I haven't even put on Twitch yet, my game room, um, there. If I just restricted myself to what is in that room, and did nothing else, didn't didn't work, didn't do house projects, didn't do anything, literally played games for fifteen hours a day. It would take me more than a year just to get through what's in there without adding any more yeah. to it, and that doesn't include <laughs> other things I want to do, like the old public. So. Uh, a year, maybe two. At that point, I'm realizing that, look, I have way more interest in, you know, it doesn't matter how special Legacy of Kane series is to someone else or whatever. I have way more interest in things I already own. I don't want to add to that list. And so I ended up watching a multi-hour retrospective. I wish I could remember the channel. There are a few channels doing it uh, pretty well these days. But it was a multi-channel or a, it was a multi-hour retrospective on the Legacy of Kane series. And so everything about, you know, starting with Raziel, and I guess later games didn't even include him, or he wasn't the main one, or I guess he was the enemy in the second one. It's, I don't fucking remember. It's it's like, I watched that thing, and I was like, that's interesting. That was hours of entertainment. On to the yeah. next thing, and I don't have to play them now. <laughs> no, and they, you know, they were. I think that was the thing about them is like, because their gameplay was fine. Like, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, thinking back to those games, it wasn't the gameplay that was like really caught me. It, I, and it was more like the, the storytelling, the like the thematics of it. Um, you know, like the first one, it, it was kind of like almost like a Legend of Zelda type game, like that kind of like adventure top down view sort of thing you're going around collecting power-ups and items and junk like that but the first one you play as kane and then like the second one soul reaver that's when you played as uh like raziel and then like they then they had this crazy story that they started in soul reaver like i mean they technically started the story in the first one which was just called blood omen um but like in soul reavers when it like the story really takes off and like you're really getting into like the, the real core of the story and like yeah, they did a few titles since then. Like they 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 did do a Blood Omen two at one point, which was did not involve like Raziel at all, but was like kind of like filling in some backstory almost for the lore and um and whatnot. And then like I think the the final chapter of the the story was called the game was called Defiance. Um, but all that aside, like you know they were fun, but like they were really cool looking, and like especially at a time. Like, this, you know, this predates things like Breaking Bad. So, like, the idea of, like, anti-heroes, the idea of, like, really complex, complicated, problematic heroes hadn't really become, like, mainstream yet, right? You weren't seeing it everywhere like you do now. Um, and so that was kind of cool. Like, you get this, like, you know, like, Kane is not a good guy. He's not the bad guy, but he's not a good guy, right? Like, and, like, Ra like you know, Ra Razel goes through this whole journey, too. And it's, so it was really cool. But, um, like, the Demon Hunters and WoW reminded me a lot of just that whole series. Just, like, the way they looked, some of their movesets, um, even just their general background and stuff. Like, it was, uh, like that kind of hooked me quick. And I was like, I kind of like this class. Let's play this. I really enjoyed, like, the intro part. Um, granted, like, no, I don't know WoW lore. I'm going to put that out there right now. Gonna, I'm a complete was, WoW noob. Dude, <laughs> you just opened up a big tangent in my mind about stuff that I don't know about. And also, you probably don't know about, but we're going to talk about it anyway. So. <laughs> we're going to sound like experts. But, like, uh, 
you know, like from what I understand though, like, you know, like obviously WoW started at one point that had a bunch of expansions. I couldn't even tell you the correct order of the expansions. Um Wrath of at the one Witch point, No, Burning Crusade, then Wrath of the Lich King, I think were the first two. And then that they sounds went, right. And then I think they went to Cataclysm, and that's what everyone pissed everyone off. Okay. And there was Legion after that? Maybe. Cause I'm pretty sure because like now the way WoW works is like you make a new character and I guess you can kind of like pick which story you want to play through. Okay. And um because like they're using like Chromie, who's like the time dragon, to sort of let you kind of jump around and do these stories however you want. Um and uh but when you make a demon hunter, you start in Legion. And like that initial story was super cool. Like I really liked like the Demon Hunter Origins and stuff like that. And then like you get done with that like opening, like you know like if this was Star Wars, this would be you know your your um home planet, right? Like this would be right, Korriban. Right, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then like uh, once you get past that though, then like you're, you're getting into like the greater story, and it's you could tell it goes MMO, right? Like it it starts being a lot less specific, and it's more. You know, we need to do these general things to to do this. Like, you know, we're trying to stop the legion. So, like, oh, we gotta do this stuff. Anyone could be doing this stuff at this point, right? Now they're just the the only things that kind of like tie your character selection in anymore is like the little specific phrases people use to refer to you, right? They could be saying, you know, oh, warrior, go do this, but now they're saying, oh, demon hunter, go do this. Like, it's not much. <laughs> but so I gotta know. But like. I ran a, I, I think we ran like a dungeon or two, and like those were fine. Like the, I'll, I'll be honest, the dungeons were acceptable. <laughs> um, the the fighting, the 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 combat in the game feels good. Uh, I, I don't have any complaints about that. My only real, if I if I sound unenthused, the only reason is because like, it's just another MMO. Like, I like that, but on the same vein, it's hard to really want to, like, jump into something like that when you're already involved in one, right? Like, you kind of, like, are doing this, and you look at it, and you're like, this is the journey ahead of me, <laughs> and you know what it's going to be, and you're like, I don't know if I'm up for that. So, like, that's kind of where I'm at with WoW. Like, I don't, I haven't subbed anyways, so I'm still stuck at, like, level 20 as my max out of, like, 70. They are nice about it because I guess like everything kind of scales to your level. Um, so I could keep playing if I wanted to and I could keep earning XP and it just kind of sits in an escrow. And if I sub, I get all that XP and I'll even like level up and stuff. Which is cool. Like that's a, you know, it's nice that Blizzard is, I was actually surprised because Blizzard has kind of a well-deserved reputation for being awful. And, um, but this is very, you know, uh, consumer friendly. So like, that was a nice surprise. Um, but I just, I just don't know if I've got it in me to uh, just grind an MMO, especially because I don't know even when I would get a chance to play it. Um, so I, that's another thing is there are people who, because I remember a ways back, Blizzard had this reputation of every time something was going to happen with a competitor, like they would time their releases so that it would combat against that and mm -hmm. I, they might have done that less because i think that i wonder if they just don't think that anybody else is big enough to be the enemy anymore except for maybe final fantasy in which case they've probably just given up but <laughs> i think that what i know that I've heard in chats, no one that I know, but I've heard in chats people talking about they jump from MMO to MMO because they are actually able to tear themselves away and just drop whatever it is that they were on because a patch came out in this other thing. So Star Wars gets its patch, they're back and they're going hard for you know one to three months. Then they go and fuck around in Warcraft, then they go and fuck around in Guild Wars whatever yeah so there are players that that do it that way but then you gotta actually give up what you were doing but as long as they're getting the enjoyment out of what they're doing as long as say to them 
okay, I subbed for one to three months on this. I got my 15 to $45 worth. That's okay. My fun is not going to be to continue to do things during the slow times. It's going to be to go and play and have a new experience in something else. Yeah. I guess and that's one way that, um, you know, it kind of would be like what you're talking about, a, a way to do it. Yeah. And that that's, uh, you know, and especially if the MMO supports that kind of, uh, like, in and out, like, that's that's good. Like, I, I you know, I, I think it also helps keep players from burning out, right? And I don't know, it's a weird state for video games these days because I feel like the vast majority of, like, advertisements for video games is done on Twitch or just in streaming. And so, like, it's weird because, like, you don't really have that much control over who's actually marketing your game for you. Um, so you do want to have, like, nice... Uh, player experiences like you want people to not be like burning out on your game and this then just raging about it and like hating it you know like because i've seen that happen with other games like oddly enough like looter shooters seem to be kind of behind the curve almost um although as a genre it might even just be kind of starting to fade a bit but like i know like warframe for a while is. had that problem that there was you know content creators and they'd just be like sort of like hate playing the game like they're streaming it and then there's complaining nonstop. They're like, "There's nothing to do." Oh, they did this, oh. and it's Destiny like because they're probably like burnt out. Like Destiny was like that before Destiny Two came out. And then Destiny Two came yep. out, and people very quickly realized how shallow it was. And, yeah, and that's the thing. And Destiny Two, it was weird that um, I made a uh, retrospective, uh, a, a post mortem is what I call it, on YouTube about. Destiny, after Destiny 2 came out, or, or right towards the end. And one of the chief complaints I had in the game was that you can you could go and do whatever it is you wanted to do in the game. Whatever it is that was the most fun to you in the game. And if it was solo content or small group content there was just about no chance that your character was going to be literally any better than they were when you logged in that day or even at the beginning of the week right and yeah. so i had proposed an idea for a system where hey how about they introduce this currency that is shared between the activities and they can scale it how they want they can make it to where they kind of reward based not so much on what it is that you're doing, but based on how much time they might estimate that it would take you to do that thing, if that's how they wanted to do it. And uh, they did that. They did that at launch in Destiny 2. They did that. They had a system that they had this shared currency. And the only difference between the currencies at different times was which planet you were on. Mm -hmm. And they gave you nothing important at all to buy with that currency. This was right. before the very shitty transmog system that's now in the game. And they didn't even look interesting at all. They were some of the most boring looking things that existed in the game. And so uh, they I would only uh go ahead. I was there, I'd only disagree in that like A, I can't remember which planet it was now, but it was the um Jensen Knight Titan Gear. Okay. Dope. That's what I always wore. <laughs> that was, that was, but like I, I agree, like the gear was unimportant. It didn't matter. They didn't even have transmog yet, you're right. But like they also didn't have any kind of like gear didn't matter at that point either, which was weird. Like, all there was was light level, and you could put, like, I think you could put... I don't even remember what you could do. I don't even know if you could do anything to armor. I, armor may have just been light level at that point still. Yeah. Like, I know you, I you, couldn't, that. you could not buy an upgrade. Yeah. With that gear that you were buying, with that stuff that you were playing for, with that currency, you could not buy an upgrade. There were things that weren't armor sets, and I don't remember... I think it ended up being like you could buy a random legendary 
but it was going to be a thing where there's probably oh, yeah. only one or two in the game on all the planets combined that were actually interesting. And once you're done with that, like this currency that you're getting just accumulates and you do nothing with it. You likely sit at cap and still don't even think that you're wasting your time because it's unimportant. I think one of those planets had one of those uh, assault rifles, I think, that was super good back then. Um, what was it called? I can't remember. I remember it was an Amalon assault rifle. But like, uh, yeah. yeah, like so like you'd roll, you'd buy those until you got like a, maybe like a good random roll on that assault rifle. And then you were done. And it was like, now what? <laughs> So, yeah, there was no upgrades. There was, I remember that the planetary comms or not comms. They were the uh, the tokens. Uh oh. Uh, Senior. Hmm? Oh, I, I saw your mouth moving, but I didn't hear anything. But now I'm hearing you make noises. No, I was mouthing the dimensions of the shelf. I'm looking. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> Actually, I... So this is my careful, meticulous planning of things, and you're kind of seeing it in action. So the way... So this is not... This is uh, the sheet that I kind of put together in GIMP that shows how I had planned everything. And so this big purple blob over here is supposed to represent this. Not all the way to the wall. Or maybe all the way to the wall. Yeah, all the way to the wall. This blob like, cannot touch. Cannot put stuff there. And so that's why this is a big purple thing. And there used to be an image underneath here. A uh, uh, a framed print. And so that's why it's actually really freaking big. Was because basically this whole space you could not work in. This shelf up here is this purple one right here. And then you've got these three right here, which are more shelves I have over here. So that made it to where I was able to figure out, okay, I've got this many inches here. That's worthwhile. That's, that's enough room to go ahead and put figures. That's fine. And so this right here, this new black piece right here is this. I didn't have this here before. I actually had the Mountain Dew clock, but the clock doesn't light up anymore. So I'm just going to put it on a wall somewhere, probably right there. Um, and not put it as a part of the board. This does light up. Um, and I had that on an Instagram story. It looks really nice. I need to drill a hole to feed the wiring through, because the wiring is actually going to go up um, and tie in with the room light. So when the room light comes on, that comes on. But anyway, all of this planning, I didn't mess around with it again after I moved a couple things. So the clock being replaced by this meant that I had to move some stuff away. And then there was also a tin decorative piece thing right here that uh, birthday, oh. <laughs> birthday gift from my mom years ago. It's actually got a great spot right there on the wall. So I'm not going to have this be a part of this display because I want this display to be more vibrant, more interesting. And this is a huge thing that would take up a lot of this board display space without it, but it's just one thing. So mm -hmm. great spot over Funny here. Is, the thing looked way bigger when you're holding it close to the camera. And then when you put it by the board, it's like, oh, that's not that big. <laughs> I was yeah, like, yeah. at first I was like, holy crap, things can be like half the board. <laughs> so this is my thinking in action is this figure right here, I actually had is this purple piece. Because this figure is, because of how high the sword goes, it's actually too tall to go into the details. And, but not tall enough where removing one shelf from the details would, because it's not 30 inches tall, 28 or whatever. So I actually wanted to make sure that this figure was accounted for in the display space. But what I'm thinking right now is that I kind of want to tighten it up to where it, it almost reaches two. The top. Yeah, but I gotta adjust this. So I kind of wanted to reach. Like that. But it's 
not currently planned like that. It's more like down here. And I think I might have to stick with that. Because, and that's why there's like another shelf right here that doesn't extend past the board. And then the mm -hmm. shelf down here. And the reason why is because if I do this with a long board, and that board extends past here, this is not enough room to put figures. Uh, oh, okay. Off, off the board, it's going to be just figures. On the board is going to be cans and stuff. Uh, more Mount 2 stuff. In addition to figures. Also, if I did... Because I think I have some shelves that would probably end right here. But could I put something here and still... I don't know. I would I would need to see... like, Do I have tall... like other tall, Another tall figure or two to sit here. So this is my... Planning in action. Uh, basically, I'm just doing it live mm. because I'm 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 iterating. So we're gonna solve that problem. We're gonna we're gonna look around. We're gonna figure it out. This. Or painter's tape is really, really useful. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I don't think I've got the time to be a multi MMO guy, especially because anything beyond Final Fantasy would pretty much just be mostly solo or daytime playing, which has gotten less and less. And it's like, I've got Warframe if I want, which I haven't really been logging into too much. Not for any particular reason, just I've been playing the game for a long time, and it's just a break's not bad. Although, new Warframe's coming up pretty quick. Well, not a new one, but a Prime version that I, I like a lot. Goss is one of my favorite frames. But uh, Hots, though. Oh, man. Hots. I've never, I've never hated the game, is the thing. I've never fallen out of love with it. It's just you know, people stop playing and playing by yourself is okay. Um, I kind of drift in and out, and I don't... But it was weird. Like, I randomly saw this one day, all of a sudden, like, Blizzard out of the blue, after a year of only just keeping the servers running, drops, like, a, a bug fix patch for it. And, like, once I saw that, like, I kind of pinged my wife's cousin, because we play a lot together, and it's like, what is going on? And then it was like a month later. All of a sudden, here comes another bug fix patch that is absolutely massive. A tiny bit of balance adjustments on it, too. And it's just like... And of course, I, I can't ignore the timing. This is literally... Like, I think that this patch gets put like on PTR like a week or two before the, the, the sale is finalized. Or like the trans... You're right, like before Microsoft picks up Blizzard. And so it's like, you're wondering, like, is this somebody, like, is this kind of like someone taking some initiative knowing that, you know, directions from on high are going to change? Because apparently there's like, I guess it's a thing. His name, I think his name, I forget his name, right? Phil Spencer. He like, he's the CEO of Microsoft Gaming. Um, I guess it's like a thing that when they pick up new like uh, studios and stuff like his general direction is do what you want as long as it's good. Um, which makes an amount of sense from a business side, Microsoft, you know, like getting these game, these gaming companies, like it's nice for them, but it's, it's a, it's a tiny um, like percentage of their overall business plan. You know, like your Activision, you acquire Blizzard, Blizzard ends up being like 40% of your revenue. Right, so you're going to want Blizzard, to, you want to want to make sure you're milking Blizzard for everything you can. You're Microsoft, you get Blizzard, and they're like, well, I, I remember seeing like some statistic on the internet, so you know it's 100% accurate. Sure. But I think they said it was something like, and all of Microsoft gaming is only like 2% of Blizzard, or of Microsoft's, you know, business, or something like that. So Blizzard is like a blip. And so if you're Microsoft, you don't need to milk Blizzard. What you want is Blizzard to be good marketing for Microsoft, right? You want 
You want Blizzard titles to draw people into Microsoft. You don't need to milk them. You know, in this case, you want Blizzard to be generating brand revenue. You know, you don't want to, or brand capital. You don't want to be expending brand capital. And so, uh, of course, you know, the hopium starts running strong. And you're going like, oh, man, are they going to revive this game? And I, I don't know if that's hopium? true. It could also just be... It, yeah, so... Uh, this is internet lingo. Fucking I, internet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm fairly new to this one. I've heard of copium. The hopium was a new one. It resonates, though. But, like... um. It, you know, it's one of those things that's like, you know, it could obviously just been someone had the job of actually like working on hots while it's been in this maintenance mode um, that Blizzard put it in. And then, you know, with the transfer, the merger happening or the, the purchase, I should say, happening that they went like, you know, I better make sure I actually push out a patch to prove that I've been doing this. <laughs> could be something as simple as that. Um, but. Well, pushing out a patch is kind of involved. And th the thing is that that second patch was really big. And I've seen people on the internet, so you know it's 100% true, say that you know they're involved in game development and like a patch that size, they, they're saying there's no way this was one person. This, this was a multi-man project. This took time. This took a lot of you know, effort to get out. And it's like, if that's true, that's cool. And I know... Like, when HOTS was going strong, when, when, when Blizzard was actually letting it live, um, the devs who worked on it seemed really passionate about it. Like, they, they always had, like, big, like, positive things to say whenever they were with the community. Like, interaction between the community and the devs was always pretty positive. Um, you know, like, I, I don't remember ever seeing players, you know, make death threats for HOTS devs like other game devs have gotten. So it's like, uh, you know, it seemed like a passion project that just was never monetized correctly. And so, you know, the higher ups at Blizzard were like, well, it's a bad game. We're not making money off of it. But it's like the players loved it. The devs liked it. Like, I don't know. It, it, it's uh, so my hope, my hope is that that when people talk about Phil Spencer being like, oh, yeah, just do whatever you want as long as it's good. Like, my hope is that there's people at Blizzard being like, Hey, maybe we can maybe we can bring Hots back. Cause they never killed it officially. Like it was never, you know, they never shut the servers off. They did say that they weren't supporting it anymore, just keeping the the they'll just maintain the servers. But but we'll see. But at that second patch, it got me back in. It got uh, my wife's cousin back in too, and uh, so we've been playing that a, quite a bit. I've uh, tried to teach a couple other friends Hots. Um, Especially because they both claim to like PvP games. So I was like, let's play some HOTS! One of them has been getting into it. He's been trying. He's, it's, a lot, it's a steep learning curve, though. The other one, I think he's picking it up quicker, but he's also, like... I think... He gets frustrated more easily, I think, with losing. Well, then... Stop playing PvP. <laughs> Here you are, be like, oh, you like drugs? Uh, how about this one? <laughs> These drugs. I like uh, this one. No. The sword fell. No, nah, it's just, it's tough, because, like, especially if you're a pretty competitive person, um, you know, MOBA, MOBAs in general, it's just, it's such a steep learning curve. Because they always put, like, a lot in them. And HOTS, HOTS is an easy MOBA compared to, like, say, Dota 2 or, like, League of Legends. But just because it's an easy mode, it doesn't mean it's, there's still not a lot of moving parts to the game. So, no. segue over to fourteen, because like Final Fantasy fourteen, mm -hmm. their PvP, like I, they have some of the best systems, I would say, for an MMO PvP. Number okay. one being, there's no gear check, none. Stats are standardized across classes, right? So like, it doesn't matter what level your warrior is or what kind of gear you have on him. When you go into a PvP match with Warrior, you have the exact same stats as every other Warrior in PvP. And they do this, like, you know, like the only, the only uh, gate for getting into PvP is you just have to get your class to level 30 and pick up the job stone. That's it. So, so I like... 
that's part of the problem that I think that a lot of games, in addition to, it's, it's a part of the problem, and I would say it's less than half the problem, but the issue a lot of the time is that what they are, what they're doing in the game with, and I'm going to use the only game that I have as a reference is like Star Wars, what they're doing what they did with what was the stat expertise expertise um what they did with that and what is even though that's now gone what they are still doing with gear rating is they are still I mean, they're not doing what you just described that another game is doing. They still, like, gear still matters. Yeah. And so, what you're doing is you're, you're creating a much bigger divide between the casuals who just want to play and are wanting to jump in and they're okay with there being some sort of a gear progression. But what you do is then you make, like, if they're just doing exclusively PvP, the current PvP armor in the game is, it caps out at a lower level than the other gear rating, than right. the PvE gear rating. And so they're already at a disadvantage if they stick to just that. In addition, when you make gear rating matter, um, and there is in this game, like if you watch people play arena in the Old Republic, what you what happens is you will find that they will start clicking on the other four names, and although class matters, if you have someone that is ten. Uh, gear ratings. Their eye rating is 10 below everyone else. They're targeted first. They are an easy yeah. kill. They have less stats overall. Their defensives are less. Their HP is way less. They're targeted. They're dead. So PvP still cares about that. gear. Even if it doesn't have the expertise, it still cares about gear. Which means they don't care. They're, they're trying to remove skill. Like They're trying to make it to where the people who are both skilled and geared are going to have a greater advantage over people who are unskilled and ungeared. If yes. they removed gear from the equation, if they did what you're talking about in a different game where they just normalize stats, then, then there's it just skill. becomes skill. Now, yeah. there's a bit of an issue with that, and that is Star Wars has the flexibility of having builds. There are certain classes in the game that do not give half a fuck about alacrity. They don't want it. Um, DPS classes. Damage classes. They don't care. There are certain healer classes where people think, oh, because PvP, I want to stack alacrity higher. That's where you... Stuff like that existing is why you can't just snap your fingers and say, normalize stats. You make some to pick from, and then are could you make like three different you know stat variations that you have to pick when going into PvP and then make you know argue that those are balanced? Yeah, you could, and it would be better than the existing system. But you would have to go through a lot of work of doing that in sub 80 PvP. Oh yeah, that's the other problem too, is like you know, even if you do normalized gear, if you don't have normalized levels, you know, like that that's another issue. And that's Again, where I think Final Fantasy kind of shines. Now, I don't want to say Final Fantasy is like the best PvP ever because it doesn't. Unfortunately, it has some of the best systems. The game modes are what's its problem. However, what Final Fantasy did, and I think this is super smart because, and I know we've talked about this before, and I know you've got some strong opinions on this one. When you have, say, we'll use Star Wars as an example, a PvP system where you go, we don't want there to be a difference between your kit 
in PvP and in PvE. You get this problem where they go, all right, we have to nerf this class because it's overperforming in PvP. But then people who don't play PvP that much are like, well, that's stupid because it's not overperforming in PvE, and now it's going to underperform in PvE. And of course, you get the, the, the opposite happening in the opposite direction where like something overperforms in, in raids, and so then it gets screwed over in PvP. And it's just, it's impossible to strike the real balance between the two. It, it's not possible. And, and so, like, you get this problematic system. Final Fantasy, they just said, F it. You go into PvP, your kit is completely different. And by completely different, it's not like... That, that's maybe not the, the best way to put it, but, like, it's, it's wild. It's because, like, they, they pared it down. Right, like you take samurai as an example in Final Fantasy. My, you know, my hot bars. I have thirty six abilities uh, on my hot bars, right? And it's like that's a lot. But you know, in PVE, that's you know, for like Star Wars, that doesn't sound probably that crazy. You go into PVE, and it's down to twelve, less eleven. That's eleven. And it's like, uh, because they, all they, they, they condensed a lot of things. They cut stuff out of the kits that aren't necessary. You know, like they redesigned the kits. They try to keep the class flavor, but they want to make the classes specifically useful in PvP. And this works then because you don't have to try and balance your PvE versus your PvP. If something's overperforming in PvP, you change it because it only affects PvP. Um, and that also means levels don't need to matter. Like you're level 30, like which, you know, the, the, the cap is 90 right now. If you're level 30 on a class and you go into PVP, you have everything that you would have in PVP. Like the level 90 class doesn't have anything more than you. So they don't even need to like, you know, break up queues for like cap versus leveling still. It's just everyone goes in together, which helps keep the populations going like Unfortunately, the only good mode that pops reliably... Well, no, that's not true. There's two modes that pop reliably. The only one you can play with with your friends is Frontline, which is a clown fiesta. But, yeah. um... Because it's like this, like... Team sizes are 24-man, and it's a three-way. So it's 24 versus 24 versus 24. Okay. Which means that, like, a lot of times winning is less, uh, you know, a, an expression of your team's skill and more an expression of how things just broke for you and whether the other teams weren't paying close enough attention to the scoreboard to realize they needed to switch who they were ganging up on. But the other game mode that pops really reliably and is super fun, high skill expression, is called uh, Crystal Conflict. And it's just like five versus five, and it's like a push the payload gameplay. But uh, yeah, but the cues, they, they pop for them and they pop reliably. They pop quick because, well, I mean, they're not, they're not fragmenting their player population outside of the game mode, you know? Like, you're not splitting people up based off of leveling or cap or geared versus ungeared or anything like that, so. Well, I will say that something that you mentioned right there about um... People at level 30 already having their kit, as you might put it. So it's related to a discussion that I had uh, a couple times recently in Star Wars in Discords about how a way that I used to learn a class when I went it, it, back towards the beginning of Star Wars, if I wanted to learn how to play a new class organically, I could go and level. And although set bonuses existed, I was still able to get the gist of the class well before hitting max level. Or at least enough to the point where it mattered, because back then, content was a little bit more difficult, uh, especially heroic and daily content, where you were actually able to get through a rotation or two where you usually needed groups to go and do certain dailies or certain heroics you don't anymore and so you got a lot more practice on the classes you were leveling and then with the set bonuses they i don't want to say that they seemed like they were less integral to the rotation when trying to actually maximize your damage i just think that 
there was less of a focus on that sort of performance. I think might be the more accurate way to say it. These days, with a just a few exceptions when it comes to damage classes, how you play a damage class changes drastically with the legendaries and the tacticals that you yeah. do not get before max level. And so you cannot go and level up to learn a new class. How that relates, so that was a discussion about the PvE learning the class thing. How this relates to the PvP is that a level 30 and a level 70 in the same mode, and I don't know if there's a split. Like, they might have a level 40 split or something like that. Point is, someone at the bottom of that sort of split and someone at towards the top, they don't, they're not going to perform equally against each other, even if you normalize things. Because moves. They don't know right. enough moves yet. And I still think that that's better and more organic to a player, especially a casual one, who is just leveling. When you go into PvP, I wonder if it should be changed there. But then how do you change it there? Do you remove moves from the player who has already leveled and acquired those moves? Do you give moves to a player who has not yet done so, and then goes back to the PvE and wonders, where's this cool move? Well, I don't have that. I guess I'll just go PvP some more. <laughs> There's no right answer. Yeah, it, it it's definitely going to be a trade-off there. Um, you know, because the idea, like, you know, you go play your PvP, you get used to this kit, you got this, you know, these set of abilities, you go to PvE and it's different. Um, especially if there are different abilities where they function in a just completely different way, right? That could be kind of jolt, jolting for someone. But on the bright side, like, so that, that will be a drawback of that system is like, there is no, um, what did it, what was it, what do they always call it in Destiny? Um, I can't remember what they call it. They're talking about, it was always when they were talking about the sandbox and they wanted there to be something in the sandbox. Can't remember. Either way, like you know that that's a thing. People will not be learning their class by PvP for a PVE. They, they you're just not anymore. It's almost like a different class that's similar. That's so you kind of mentioned it a little bit of having different sets entirely. That I think would be okay. That I would encourage, but development time, but money. So no, and that sucks. Yeah. No, that's why, like, with Final Fantasy, it kind of breaks my heart a little bit because they've actually given the resources to do that and do it well. I've actually even made the joke. It's not even a joke. I've actually made the comment. I think the PvE kits are better than the PvE ones for a lot of the classes. Like, they're cooler. They're more, like, they, they, they capture the fantasy better almost. Um, but it's like uh, they just fail on giving us really great game modes. And my whole segue to Final Fantasy was because we were talking about MOBAs, and they actually have a MOBA game mode in Final Fantasy. But like I was saying, there's a lot of moving parts in MOBAs. It's like that game mode is the least popular one, despite the oh. fact that I do think it's significantly better than the three-way. It's Did just... I see that they also have Fall Guys in the game now? Or like a Fall <laughs> Guys mode? It's a, it's a crossover event, yeah. So... um. So uh, the Gold Saucer, so for people who played Final Fantasy VII, um, you know, that name's very familiar. Um, the Gold Saucer, it's like a casino where you just play, like, a lot of, like, little, like, side games. Um, most of them are just real simple things. Um, they had one that was called Leap of Faith, which was basically just, like, a jumping puzzle kind of game uh, for people who like to do that, that kind of platforming stuff in MOBAs. Um, and just for the viewers out there uh jumping puzzles aren't actually puzzles it's a misnomer true yeah there, there's true. nothing puzzling about them did that start with destiny because i know that like jump maps and things existed on on say counter-strike but we're i don't know i don't i didn't hear jumping puzzles until destiny so i don't know if something existed like before that I I can't say either i don't know when that name came about you know it wouldn't make it wouldn't surprise me if Destiny kind of made that name a bit more popular just because they put those in their raids, right? And they made, like, the correct path not obvious. They, that was the true... 
I, like, I would say that that became less true with time because, but even at the beginning, even with Vault of Glass, just stand there and watch. And I don't know how <laughs> familiar you were with Vault of Glass. I don't, because I think I didn't get you guys into Destiny until a ways later, but. Um, Aiken King, yeah. So there wasn't really much of a reason to go back into the Vault of Glass. And I don't know if you guys were playing through Age of Triumph, but. We did, and we, we did Vault of Glass a bit. Like, okay, I wouldn't so, say like, I'm just, super familiar with it, but... Just watch. just And you can see the path thing. Like, watch it play out twice. You've got it memorized. Like it, it, anyway. I hate jumping puzzles as a name, and it wasn't a critique on you saying it. You're using the terminology that people are familiar with. Yeah. But, but, I just wanted to throw that little gripe in there. <laughs> little, little tangent rant. But yeah, so, they, you know, they had one of those already in Final Fantasy. It was just a little mini game. Um, so yeah, when they did the Fall Guys crossover event thing, um, they it's just again another mini game in the gold saucer. You can go and play it. You queue up, and it is, I guess, PvP esque because like it's three rounds, and like it starts with I think twenty four people, and then it's like the first sixteen people to complete the first round progress to the second round. So in that regard, there is a PvP element in that you are trying to go faster than at least a per, you know a percentage of the participants um but there, there's no messing with each other though you can't like interfere with people i guess in a way it's sort of like a okay so in that case that makes me think it's more like a this is gonna i don't want to open up the discussion about sports or anything like that again but that's kind of like golf like you yeah, going yeah. out on your own and you going out against other people you don't affect each other's play and again, uh, that's why I don't think score a comparison. I don't think that golf is a sport. Same with bowling, because it's really just you performing at the same time. You practice for that window of time to get better and to hope that the other person has a bad day. But so it's not so that takes the PvP element out of it. If you cannot affect another person's progress, right? Exactly. That it's like. It's like uh, it, it's not really in my mind any more PvP than when you're trying to do like leaderboards in like Diablo three seasons or something, right? Like it's a sure, race kind sure. of, but like <laughs> it's but about as it. it. But until the very end, where you said that you can't affect the other players, right? It actually kind of sounded like, wait, is this like an attempt at a PVE BP thing? Like if you could, like if your character had some sort of a like an inner bubble that got stronger as it went towards the center, and you were able to kind of push or nudge others, not forcefully, not in a way that was very reliable, but kind of like, kind of like in Fall Guys, um, a Are little, bit, but maybe even guys? light, but maybe even lighter. But the goal was still you getting to a place like that would kind of be like a PVEVP type thing. Mm -hmm. To me, and that's what this is like. It's. There's no, and there's no, I don't, I've never played Fall Guys, so like, I'm assuming when you're talking about the I only just watched it. Bump. Okay. But yeah, but you, like, could, yeah you could not occupy the same space as another player. You had uh -uh. this, you had a sort of a little bubble type thing. Okay. Yeah. And there's, there's no collision with other players in okay. the Final Fantasy version. So, um, so yeah, it, there's really no affecting other people. The only way you can affect other people is just by getting done before them so that they don't make the cutoff. Um, and that's really it. like, you know, and then they, they have like, it does three rounds. So like the, you know, the second round is the top eight instead of the, you know, out of the 16. And then the last round is just, can you get first? Can you get done first? And like, sure. it, it's very casual. Like you get points awarded for you, no matter how well you do. Um, but the further you can get, the more points you get. And then you use these points to just buy like some cosmetics and stuff like that. But okay. It's actually kind of funny. Like we we keep talking about my wife, and actually we keep saying like, "Man, we gotta do the Fall Guys event" because we still haven't really. We've done like I think what two matches maybe, and like uh, so we have not gotten the cosmetics. I think I bought one piece so far, but so that's on our docket. It's <laughs> so so yeah, Star Wars. Fixing Star Wars PvP would require a complete rework, rehaul, and it's one that you could not do without pissing people off, but it could be done. Like, the existing game could actually get reworked in such a way that you change PvP to where it becomes no, no longer gear-dependent, so the progression, 
basically make it no progression. You could do that in PvP games. What you're describing about Final Fantasy seems like it's like that already. In addition, yeah. think about games like Overwatch. You never got better, ever. You were, yep. as far as stats and stuff like that go, right. you were just that character. Why can't that be the case in Star Wars? You know, if you want yeah. to choose abilities to put in your hotbar, that's fine. But then we also move into your character should be different in PvP. That was something that was true in Destiny. I was always a proponent of, the like, if you want to play PvP, you would get this PvP loadout, essentially. And they do have loadouts in the game now. Um, yeah. So you have a PvE loadout, PvP loadout. None of the gear, any of it, whatsoever, transfers. You have a starter PvP set. You have a starter PvE set that you kind of are wearing already. You go into PvP, you start to get more drops. You start to get more of the gear that only works in that mode. It has different set bonuses tied to it. It's balanced specifically to that mode. PvP, go nuts. Do the whatever the fucking sniper rifle was. Um, that would... Uh, what was the name of the sniper rifle? It was one of the launch exotics, I think, that would regen armor over time. I don't remember. Like a beam sniper or whatever. And that became broken in PvP. You could Because once they moved to a point where you didn't immediately have... Like, you started with a limited amount of secondary and no tertiary, that, game, that gun became broken because you just put it away and it would regenerate ammo. You didn't have to go and get ammo pickups. Oh, geez. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. You know, you know, um, a game that does have like PVE progression, they also did it in, I don't think that they have like a hard divide between like PVE and PVP in terms of like class design and functionality. Um, and they solved this problem with the progression for PVP was uh, Guild Wars 2. I've only dabbled in that game. I haven't really gone, you know, I never really gone in hard on it. But uh, I remember you make a brand new character and you literally will go like one of your tabs and it's like your PvP loadout. And when you go into your PvP loadout, you get everything. It's like, yeah, your level, your max level, you know, pick the gear you want to have when you go into PvP. And it's literally end game gear. Like you're picking which end game gear you want to wear in PvP. So like, it's almost like you get to just be maxed out automatically when you go into PvP and you can pick how you want to do it. And I thought that was kind of cool. Right. I know that game, like from a lot of things I've heard, people would say that that game was designed around PvP first and then they made a PvE mode to, uh, you know, so people could keep playing. But um, I don't know how true that is. But, you know, I thought that was a decent way to do it. So like, for, you know, if Star Wars didn't want to come up with a, whole new kit for their pvp you know for for classes in pvp they could do the guild wars 2 thing where they just say all right you know what you go into pvp you get your whole damn kit put your abilities on your hot bar you know your your gear is maxed out like or like you know pick your gear like when you go into pvp like you can go to over like the fleet talk to like the you know the pvp npcs and you can set up your gear for that with them like that, I mean, that could work for them if they, you know, again, to get rid of those barriers that, because like, I, I mean, I don't know how, what Star Wars player population is like, but I can't imagine it's big enough that they're happily fragmenting the PvP population. It's not terrible. I mean, it, it can get a little bit worse at night, and that's more true now that they move the APAC players away. But APAC players, the ones that were wanting to go really hard, they were already angry about the fact that their ping rate is really high. Yeah. So there was like 200 milliseconds plus in PvP. And so that already made them feel like they couldn't do too well. I honestly don't know. I mean, you could probably ask some of them. I'm in a couple of discords for Australian guilds because I was playing with Australia because of my sleep and stuff. I would move over and I'd be doing Australian uh, or operations with Australian groups a lot of the time anyway. Mm -hmm. But the... So I could probably ask a couple of them. One of the initial things that was a very frequent topic when the Apex server just got released was, oh, what's your ping now? What's your ping now? 
I don't remember what I've heard. I don't think it was stellar, and I also don't think that it was actually too bad for Americans either. Hmm. So I don't know. The I don't know where hilarious. I don't know, I don't know if they've said where the server is. It would be hilarious if, like, the server was still like in North America, and they're all. See, like... that's the thing. It could still be a because they also <laughs> they didn't do this until after they migrated everything to cloud servers, which, by the way, had, from what I can tell, no noticeable impact. The only singular singular thing that I noticed being a little bit better was now finally. The, the screenshot button works for longer and more than like one or two presses without having to quit the game and start it up again. That was it. It had to, I have to go that freaking low or weird or out of the way. Not anything that actually matters when it comes to the game. All of the bugs like People still appearing dead to other characters inside an operation, meaning they can't even be targeted or healed. That's still a problem. Loading screen of death that people are often finding when they are leaving operations. Like people are figuring out workarounds for these type of things, but the workarounds themselves are not 100%. And it's just a problem. Just always a problem. None of these things were fixed by cloud server. Nothing. So, I think the only thing that got server? fixed by yeah, I think the only thing that probably got fixed by cloud server was uh, the team going, "Hey, we don't have to maintain a server room anymore." Yeah, that was probably it. That, that's what they fixed. They fixed their end. They did mention that like it'll allow certain updates to be done while things are live. And that kind of makes sense because, yes, yeah, or smaller smaller things can be done without what normally would have had to be a bigger patch, bigger changes. But... Right. Uh, so I guess another topic, since we're on, you know, since you've been kind of going back into your... Uh, Games that you had played previously. That reminds me of an Instagram post, a story, because I use my stories a lot. That. Uh, cosplayer friend of mine had put up, and then it got me doing the same thing. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. Hope that I can actually hold. Hang on. There we go. See how well you can actually see this. Come on, camera. Focus. Oh, uh, oh what oh, the? Oh, there, there it is. There it is. Oh, your screen turned off. Oh man. <laughs> This phone. Phone. Did your phone die? This isn't the first Pixel 2 have done this. The one that I had when I was actually out and about touring around London in the only hotel room I have ever been in that gives you a cell phone. There's a cell phone in the room. You can take it out with you and use it. It has its own number. You can call back to the hotel as a speed dial uh, type thing. It, you can use pictures. You can do all that sort of stuff. And I was like, why the hell does this exist? Why would I ever use this? Then I went out toward London and towards the end of what I wanted to do that day, but not after the end, my phone shut itself off and would not turn back on until I got back to the room and plugged it in. So had I taken that cell phone, that second cell phone with me, I would have had the ability to take more pictures and do more stuff. <laughs> but it was a Pixel I phone that just decided to shut off and not turn back on until I had plugged it into a source. 
Why did it shut off just now? I don't know. Huh. Oh, man. Did it die, though? Like, I mean, was the battery low? No. I no? actually unplugged it so that I could show you the picture. All right. I'm just not going to hold Instagram. I took a screenshot of it. So, all right. Let's get back to this game. All right. All right. I can. We're super close. All right. There it is. What are we looking at now? Six video games get to know me. Description. What? No trigger. I don't know what that one is. Something undiscovered. And then like a whole bunch of video games. So. Inscription. Chrono Trigger. Persona 5. Specifically Royal. Oh, that's what all those games are on the bottom. They're all yeah. Persona yeah. Fives. Okay. The Old Republic. Ikaruga. And Infinite Undiscovery. Um, so a topic that you and I have discussed, or that I guess more accurately I've discussed with you, is uh, single-player games. Doesn't need to be console, but normally is. And so that Instagram story came up yesterday. I decided to partake. Now, of course, I've got many, many, many choices. In fact, I'm going to go grab some real quick. Because uh, I'm almost done working on them. But I'll be right, right back. So first I will show the four sizes. So these are wrapped on just particle board. Canvas prints. I had them, I, I picked all of the images myself and I had them printed on this canvas and then I wrapped them around these boards. And they are four different sizes and the four different sizes, these are just about as close as you can get to the correct um, to identical pixel counts on the different sizes. So it goes from a one by one ratio down to something that was really funky that I, I don't know why I did it. Um, this is a four three, this one I think is a 16 nine. Point is, these are about the same number of pixels. So the each image, even if it's a different ratio, still has the same representation basically. And so, I made 11 games that were this size. Uh, this is, by the way, the TMNT arcade game for the NES. And it's the only one that has these Pizza Hut uh, hmm. boards that fall off the wall. You can probably tell what this one is. Yeah, that looks like uh, the hung jury in the bottom there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, good old hung jury. Geometry Wars Retro Evolved. This is an arcade only game. Okay. For the 360. And this just happens to be, I just happen to grab different games. This is split second, also for the 360. So there are 11 of each size, and I need to make at least two total more. I want to come up with two more to make it four so that I can make one more of each size. Point is, those are um, games that meant something to me. 
and it's you know when I finally get around to finishing the room and making a, a, a game tour or a game room tour, it's going to go into those pieces. It's not going to talk about each of them, but basically they are conversation pieces. And all of the games have like to make the list because I didn't pick forty four because I like the number. It had nothing to do with it. I just made a list of all of the games that I thought were meaningful in some way to me, and I just kind of made a cutoff. All of those games made me think about video games differently. They showed me something new. They got me thinking about whatever. And so that's what those, all of those games did that. And so when I saw that little Instagram story thing, I thought, oh, shit, I've got a lot to pick from. You want me to pick six? But I realized that's not quite what it's asking. It's asking games to get to know me. So that's where that's why I picked those that I did. Now there were still a couple others I was considering. I was considering the original Final Fantasy for one of them, um, and that one kind of tied with Infinite Undiscovery. But then I started to think about how the games play, and I thought, okay, if that if I make it that the tiebreaker, the original Final Fantasy in almost all of its iterations is kind of broken and very unbalanced, whereas Infinite Undiscovery yeah. is incredibly incredibly deep and has reasons and rewards for replay value at higher difficulties and so you and therefore even just playing through the game once there is so much more choice when it comes to party selection there is there are points throughout the game where you actually have three parties at once and then the game itself is just longer, even if you only play through it once. So, like, that kind of broke the tie, and that's why that gets on there instead of the original Final Fantasy. So, it kind of sucks. I don't have any shelves that are like this. That's why. Anyway. Um... So that, I wanted, because I, I keep trying to get you, Inscription included, to play more yeah. single-player games. <laughs> I want, because I know that you have a lot of those in your history that you really like playing. And I kind of want to know what more of them are. I kind of want you to tell me more about some of those things. Like if you were not, a, not necessarily a pick of six games that to get to know you type thing, but, you know, except for Final Fantasy VII, which we all know, is an incredibly boring PlayStation 1 game that you don't need to waste your time with. <laughs> other games. I did because I actually don't know if we have talked about other games that you played back in the day. Ah. Uh, back in the day, huh? Let's see. Single yeah. player games from back in the day. Well, I don't know if these would be like get to know me games, but the games that I did just I went nuts on. I mean, Chrono Trigger was one of them, so we got that one in common. Um, it was a lot of RPG type stuff. So, like, a link to the past. I, I was a, that was always like a favorite. I'd go back to. I got to the point too where I, I think there was w one time where I got I beat the whole game in a single playthrough. I wanted to get because like, I got remember if, if you played that game like when you beat it. Um a little number would pop up underneath your your link there in the in the when you could in your three save files my first and it said how how many loads to beat the game uh i've heard about that so my first zelda was actually ocarina oh okay um so yeah so i think eventually i i don't remember how old i wasn't that old i probably maybe middle school i think maybe something when i finally got the uh the one for my for my little link there um i love that game Final Fantasy VI was another big one. Um, so did you have the, the Super Nintendo Final Fantasy III? Yeah, yeah, okay. yep. And uh, yeah, it was called Final Fantasy III back then. I remember because it was uh, back in my hometown, which is a tiny little town. Well, it wasn't tiny, tiny. By most people's estimation, it was tiny. By the Upper Peninsula of Michigan's estimation, <laughs> it was decently sized. 
<laughs> but like uh, we had this place called Very Video for a while. That's where everyone rented all their videos and all their video games. And then uh, when they went out of business, this guy, he used to be an employee of theirs. He, um, he I, I guess he got a lot of their old product for video games and stuff. And he opened up a shop called Hot and Cold Games. I think his last name was Cole or something. And maybe it was his first name. I don't remember. But uh, yeah, so Hot and Cold, not Cold. And it was just like a video game rental store. Sadly, he also went out of business. It lasted maybe a year or two. Um, but from that was that was when I got introduced to Final Fantasy III. I remember renting it from him, and then his place started going out of business, and like he was starting to sell off his product. So like rather than return the game, I just contacted him. I was like, I want to buy it. But that game ate up. I think I picked up that game in sixth grade, and it like ate up so much of my free time. And it's like sixth and seventh grade. Like I played through that game so much. Um. That one was good. I never actually played the first Final Fantasy, which is kind of because like Final Fantasies became like a big thing for me later. Uh like trying to think like going through like high school and stuff. Like you know, it was like I picked up all the new Final Fantasies whenever they come out. I got like we talked about Legacy of Kane earlier. I got into Legacy of Kane games. Um. I won't lie, though, like, a lot of the games, like, if it sounds like they're all just, like, role-playing games, it's because, like, they pretty much were. Because, uh, like, we, we, our house was kind of, like, it was kind of a weird, like, a revolving door, sort of. Friends were always coming over at weird times, and there always seemed to be, like, someone over at the house. I think part of it was just my, my brother had developed a pretty large friend group, too, and, like, they, uh, there was a couple of them that, I think they just wanted to get away from their house a lot of the times. And so they just come over and hang out without even like calling or anything. They just show up and be like, Hey, what's going on? <laughs> so we'd, uh, you know, play a lot of video games. So a lot of like multiplayer games did get played, but like, it wasn't like, you know, it'd be like simple ones. Like just, you know, like, Oh, I remember for some reason, was it NHL 96 or something like that? We played a bunch of that one. Like, I don't know. We had some Madden football game. We played that a fair amount. Some of like the like Tekken, when we had a PlayStation, we played a fair amount of Tekken. Um, although I, people tended not to pick up Tekken too much to get us to play because my brother and I got pretty good at it compared to everyone else. Okay. Um, uh, real quick, Sniper, I'm sorry. I went to go get a Dragon Ball t-shirt that I have to put on. It's in the dirty clothes. So we're just... I'm not grabbing that out. Yeah. But like, uh, see other single player games. If I go back even earlier, like elementary school age, back when we were playing just the NES, Ninja Gaiden was a game we'd bang our heads off of a lot. That was at like the NES days, though. It felt like single player games. It was like you didn't play them to enjoy them. You played them because it was like, God damn it, you were gonna beat this game. <laughs> So, okay, so that brings up something that I actually, an interesting discussion that is accurate, but I actually had it with my mom early this year, back in April. And that is that, so even as, so my dad is the one who was responsible for getting me into gaming. And my next brother, my oldest brother, was not that much more than two years younger than me. And so he was old enough when we got our uh, NES, because we had some Ataris before that point, and he kind of just watched as, as they were being played. He was old enough at that point when we got the NES to play it, enjoy it, know what he was doing. But I remember we were asking, like, this is a fun, this is a toy, this is a game. Mom, why aren't you playing? And I remember this was back, she must have had experience prior to this. She basically said that video games anger her when she can't do something, you know, when she's not good enough to do this thing. And so she didn't play them, she didn't like them. Fast forward to today, and I uh, go up earlier in the year to watch after her after a surgery and 
she's on her phone doing like Wordle or or whatever the fuck is going on right now with the phone stuff. Mm-hmm. And like saying, so I kind of wanted to build off of that. I said, okay, obviously, different games are different. There are games that is a video game, even if it's casual, that is a video game. So there was something yep. that I wanted to share with her, and that was back in the NES days, a lot of those initial games were arcade ports. And the point of arcade games was to make money. To get so you to pump you, quarters into them. You fucking died in those games a lot. That was the point. That's why they existed. And so those initial games, Mom, that you were playing, those actually were designed to not be fun, to kill you, so that you had to start over. You had lives and continues. Some of them did not have many lives or continues. They didn't, you know, you to this day, to this day, and it seems ridiculous because I could probably go back and do it in one sitting. I have not beaten the original Turtles game on the on the Nintendo. Uh, I oh still, god, that game still oh, have not game. beaten it. And I'm watching people doing speed runs, and it's like they don't lose anybody. What the fuck is this? Okay. So, um, so I kind of shared with her. I was like, I think once it came around to the 16-bit generation and especially past that, if you started to play those games where you weren't really dying, you were still able to progress, that's where I think you would have got into it, but she didn't try again when it got to that point. And so I told her that maybe give games another shot. They aren't the way that they used to be. They aren't the way that you remember them from back when you first gave them a shot. Yeah, that was definitely Ninja game. Make you mad. But like, like um, oh man, TMNT, I remember that one. See, but like that, like the, what was it? The TMNT, the original one, I didn't play a ton because it was so hard. It was so hard. And then I remember the arcade version came out, but that wasn't really a single player. That one we always played with friends. Yeah, that's uh, I, technically actually both of them. I haven't beaten either of them until I got the arcade, that Turtles arcade that's in there, and you can just press the button and beat the game. You know, you just I, I probably died four or five times on the Shredder Krang fight, and you know, so it's just it's different now. But on the NES, I never beat either of those games. There is a cherished memory I have in a house in Alaska where my dad and I sat down and he kind of had this mentality of, all right, we're going to beat this. And we didn't play with my dad too often. You know, he was, if he wasn't deployed, he was still busy. And so when we, when he sat down to play with us, that was something. And I was the oldest brother. I got to be the other one that he thought was the most success, you know, most chance of beating the game. And we still didn't do it. We still, we got further than we had ever seen in the game before. We didn't beat the game. And we didn't have the multi-tap, so we couldn't three or four player it. So mm. that was... So I never beat either of those NES Turtle games. Mm. Oh, man. I think there was a, a single-player game that I actually did put a fair amount of time into. I think part of it was probably because I did... My, it was right after the SNES came out. And that Christmas, my brother got it because his birthday was in November. So he got like an SNES for his birthday. So for Christmas, we got a few games, right, for the SNES. And I know he got Super R-Type, which was like a, you know, like a side-scroller game Schmuck. where you're like a spaceship. And yeah, I don't know what, they, what the genre is called these days. Shmup. But, um, shoot him up. Shoot him up? Okay. And then I got Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Oh, what the fuck? Okay, there's a good example of a 16-bit game that was not one of the new types. That no, was arcade no, no. style. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, like, I remember going through that game, and it was just that game. Because you'd get through, and you'd get to, the, like, so it was eight stages, right? And I think like they, what they'd do, though, is it was, like, I think I stage this, had, like, two parts, I, maybe? I think... Uh, I made this joke when we were doing We Talk Over. I don't know how many stages it has. I was very familiar with the first half of the first stage, and that yeah. was it. All right. 
Oh my god. And it's just like at some point though, because I've been I remember like the first time I got and I beat stage the the second half of like seventh stage. It's like, yeah, we're on the last stage. And then like the little princess appears and she's like, no, nah, you gotta have the princess bangle. Please go back to the very beginning of the game and find it. And it's just like, are you fucking kidding me? And uh so I remember the S so we used to have a subscription to Nintendo Power and they gave us uh they you know in that I think there was a cheat code to just go right to the end of the game. I remember oh, using that. That was that okay. was the first time I ever beat the boss, but I, I never counted it. It was like, all right, so I've seen the ending of the game, but like I had a cheat to do it. Once, I think only once in my life was I like, no, we're doing this for reals. Go through all the levels, beat them, get sent back to the beginning, go through the levels, make sure I have the Princess Bangle when I go to beat that last boss because that Princess Bangle blew as a weapon, period. It was so bad. And it was like, and against the last boss, it was a nightmare because like the, the range on the Princess Bangle was determined by like the tier of armor you were wearing. Okay. Which meant, like, in order to have, like, an appreciable range to fight the last boss, who you needed range on, because he had a shitload of attacks that, like, zoned you out, uh, you had to have, like, the gold armor, so you couldn't get hit. You had to beat this boss without ever getting hit once. It was just, oh, it was a nightmare. A nightmare. I think once ever did I get past him, get to the final boss, and then beat the final boss. Once. And I don't know how long we had that game for before I finally did that. It had to be years and years. Oh, it was the worst. I'm trying to map out where I want these things, and I have no <laughs> idea. It's, it's easy with these little square ones to be like, okay, just mount the thing in the middle and then figure it out later. But I don't want to figure it out later. Like this, this, this planning right here on this screen, hmm. it's for a reason. For a reason. Because another thing that comes into play was the shop that I got these made at. If they were being made for me, they didn't really care about the quality. And so a lot of these things have chips or scratches or almost chips or burns on the melamine or scratched or scuffed banding, dirty, all kinds of stuff. Which means that if I mounted this this way with this chip on top, that means that I want this to be mounted high. So I'm trying to think where would be the better place for this? Where would I mount it so that I have something up high, but I need to have something that I'm going to put there, whether it's a figure or do stuff. And I'm trying to think about that right now, but ah. So I guess if I go, I'm going to, I'm going to go, uh, Try to regale more about NES while I take a quick trek back to my game room real quick. I want to grab another um, take a quick look at my NES games and get a couple things to chat about. Because I'm sure I would think a lot about a lot more if I was doing that yeah, instead of just going off memory. Man, I don't even NES though. Like, I'm trying to think back, we had we had a lot of NES games by the end of it before we picked up the uh, Super Nintendo. But I don't remember what I really played that much on there. To be honest, I mean, I mean a lot of Mario Three, I guess. Definitely, uh, definitely. But you know, like, I guess it would have been anything that was not too insanely difficult, because. I was still pretty young by that point. Like, what? I think I was only in grade was A when we got the SNES. Was it third grade? Fourth grade? I don't know. Something like that. But like, uh, the NES, NES. Yeah. See, like nothing's really, I mean, there was some games like there was, uh, I guess, was it called, um, night, 1942? Is that the name of the game? But it was like another like shoot 'em up where you're just playing as like a like a B2 bomber or something like that. You're just flying around in levels, shooting stuff. 
um there's some tank game that we played i don't know yeah yeah 1942 and okay that was a they had a lot of them back then they had helicopter ones too and uh, those were again a lot of those were ports as well but i think some of them were a lot more forgiving than others like when you went into sci-fi those were the ones where it was it seemed like they just wanted to cover the screen more and they could yeah. realistically do that kind of more in flavor, and so they did. And so, yeah, 1942 was was one of those more manageable ones. Oh man, so Castlevania, we put a lot of t- I put a lot of time into Castlevania, never doing good. I don't think I ever beat the original Castlevania. Um, but that was definitely one of those you know punish you kind of games. But when they did Super Castlevania for the SNES, that one was much more doable. I put a lot of time into that one. I love that one a lot. I had a lot of fun with that one. Well, I, I'll finish up on the NES then, I guess. Yeah, the NES, it's just, I'm trying to remember some, like, there's a lot of, like, side-scroller or, like, just shoot 'em up kind of games. Well, I, um, I mean, I can add on. So... Did you ever have a game called Spot? Spot? Spot. Do you remember the 7-Up character? Where just the dot. And they put sunglasses and stick arms and legs on them? I think I do. Guys, I'll go grab it real quick. They had a puzzle game. Spot. No, not Spot. And yet. I think I remember this. I don't think I ever played this game. I think I remember seeing it, though. Play a tic tac. So, connect four board. You played on. A, it was an eight by eight board, and the uh, it was an eight by eight board, and the point was, let's just say it was two players. First player would have top left and bottom right. They would have yellow pieces, and then the other second player would have top right, bottom left. They would have blue pieces. And you could... You had to select one of your pieces and then choose where to move it. You could move one in any direction, including diagonally. If you did so, you kept your original piece, but you planted a new one. If you moved two spots in any direction, you would lose that original one, but you would jump two spots and allowed you to make some moves. Whenever you made a new... At the end of that turn, when you place the new piece, any of the opposite colors, any anybody else's colors around you, would change to your color. And so that's how the game played out. Then when the last thing was filled, the game ended and the player with the most wins. And it was up to four players. And since it was done on turns, you could do, like, we didn't have to have the multi-tap. We just passed controller around. So that was a lot of fun. That was a party digital tabletop game that we had that we spent a lot of time with. And you had and you could play against the computer too. And so playing against the computer in a lot of the if you played against one other computer, they were good, but it got to a point where even as a kid I was able to beat them. But if you played against two others, it seemed like they were always going against you. Like all three of them would try to go against you. And so one of them would usually end up on top. I'm trying to figure out now. I have. As far as boards that cross almost the whole thing, I've only got two left. And so the thing is, I don't know if it's how visible on camera it is. Oh, you can see them. 
he's right here. You see these four dots? Uh huh. Uh -huh. So, so this is where the vinyl was put over these screws that are coming from the back side on one of the the hinges that this thing is hanging on. And it's not called a hinge. I'm losing it all. Cleating. It's it's a metal oh, cleating. Okay. Yep. And so I want one to, you know, I, I want those covered. I actually intend to put a shelf in front of those. I guess I could do it with one of these. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Because I'm wanting to break things up. It's not just going to be long shelves all the way down. I'm wanting to break things up. And I thought, you know, first thing below the big one should be Shelf like that. And also, do you know what's something I realized with you know the first shelf that I was working on up here was that if I want to continue past this point, even just something as simple as marking the two spots to drill right here, I have to make sure that the board is even. So I need to hold it up while it's a level on top, which means I need to hold it up on both sides, and then I don't have hands to mark the thing. So I'm thinking. How about Waterboy come over and we have the same chat, but we're on the same mic if we can hear each other and all that sort of stuff. You want to come over, buddy? You want to help me with this <laughs> little thing? <laughs> Someday in the future. Someday. Someday. There was... Solaris Pajama Stream. Yes. Yes. More so because I'm not heating my house uh, this winter for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is money. Two, uh, well, no, we'll leave the other reasons separate. Uh, but what I have been doing is that it does kind of increase in heat throughout the day, of course. I'm running a computer right now with, with monitors. But what I've been still doing during the night when it's dropping down into low 50s is... Um, I'm still, like, I'm leaving windows and doors open at night. And so it's still cooling way down. Like, it was actually 60 degrees when I woke up this morning in the house. So I'm staying warm in the morning, so. Oh, that sucks. That sucks. No, like at night, it's dropping down to even lower than that. It's dropping down to in the 50s here in Arizona. So one of these for here, and then another one of these. I want to do something like this. And then I have one more big one out here. But this one is big, big. This is eight inches, and so I want, I want it to be on the bottom, so I can put some of the larger figures down there. Twenty. Yikes. Okay. Spot. Zigzez, X E X Y Z. I never hear anybody else talk about this game. I loved it. Z X Y Z. X E X Y Z. Base action in. It was so interesting. It was so neat. Just this weird sci-fi thing where you got a bunch of different weapons. Every stage looked different. 
It came with a new weapon that usually was really catered toward what you were about to go up against. And then at the ed end of all of them, you got into a new ship that looked like a new animal. And you went and fought this new half-screen boss. So, that was a lot of fun. That's a game that I want to play on stream, and I'm probably going to have to petition... Not petition, but I'm going to have to ask Twitch. I, I, I'm going to look right now. Does Twitch have this as a game category, or is it just put under the uh, retro? Right. So, X, E, X, Y, Z thing. I can't imagine Twitch has this. <laughs> <laughs> it has this game called Hex, Hex, Hex Force is Hex Force for PlayStation Portable is a traditional RPG taking place in the world of Burge. This world has two sides to it, the one light and one dark. Accordingly, the player will be able to choose between two different protagonists at the game's beginning. In a light scenario, the protagonist is a shrine maiden by the name of Cecilia, whereas the dark parts hero is a knight called Levin. Depending on this choice, the setting, story, and characters will change fundamentally. That sounds like a game I want to buy. Also, it's not Zig Ziz. It's not... So there's a stream? It's retro. It's just retro. Can I get this game its own category? Please. I want to. Also, how the hell did this backloggery channel play Zegzez and Overcooked in the same stream? <laughs> that is so random. That is so random. I love this game. I, lo I absolutely... I don't even know if I beat it as a kid. I don't know. It was one of the... Again, limited lives, limited continues. Oh, Solaris, I just searched for it. I searched for the category, and the streams that have it show up as retro. So there's just a retro category of what they're... Why do that, though? Because there's a limited number. They are not really making more NES games anymore. So... Why do it that way? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Zegs as... Chippendale's Rescue Rangers... That was a game that a lot of NES players got, and then a game that a lot of NES players did not get. It had a very it's a very expensive game these days, is the sequel. They didn't make a lot of it. Um, and I don't remember why. I think they were only able to print so many before a li a a license fell out or something like that. I don't remember. Um, and then the last one I wanted to talk about on the NES was Batman. Did you get that Batman game? I don't think so. That doesn't sound familiar at all. I still remember the original. Did I play that? I had Something to have like played this. Something close. I don't to think that. we owned it though. I think someone else had it, like in our neighborhood, and I might play it there sometimes. Nuts and milk. Nuts and milk. I don't remember. Do you have Zigzags, Solaris? I found the tank game. I kept trying to remember. It was called Iron Tank. I played a lot of Iron Tank. It was ridiculously hard, though. So uh, another SNES game I remember I played a lot of, though, dude. In in uh, line with the Batman one was um the Spider Man. It was no like Spider Man and the X Men. Is that what it was called? I think so. I played that one a bunch. I like that one a lot. There was a Genesis game that I played. I think oh, I have a me. copy now. It was Altered Beast. Tell me it was Altered Beast. I actually did not have Altered Beast. <laughs> um, I love Altered no, Beast. <laughs> since you mentioned Spider-Man, there was a game called Separation Anxiety. And I remember telling my parents, I, I saw an ad for it in a magazine. 
remember telling my parents I wanted to rent it. And they both looked at each other. And they didn't believe that it was the name of a video game. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it, it was, and it had to do with the symbiotes. Symbionts? Symbi whatever. And okay. So, like, a lot of the enemies throughout the game were low-level symbionts, but then the bosses were, like, Venom and Carnage and Shriek and, and all of them. So, uh, that was 16. Yeah, it's just we're moving into 16. Yeah, we never had a Sega, so like... Uh, oh, you missed. Well, we had friends who had it, thankfully, but also occasionally we could rent one for like a reasonable price, I think. So I remember there was a period of time there where we, we rented a Sega, or maybe someone had let us borrow a Sega, and so we were like renting games for the Sega like crazy. Um, I know I sunk a lot of time into the second Sonic game. Um, but like Altered Beast was... That one was close to my heart. It was so bad, but I loved it. I loved it. Um, it was not good, uh, but I didn't play. <laughs> I didn't play too much of it. That you also missed out, and it's going to be a topic. Sega Channel. This is going to be a topic I'll, I'll get onto later. Um, but I also just something you said made me think. Oh, something I said made me think. So in addition to separation anxiety not sounding like a video game, I also, uh, eh, maybe around the same time, there was, uh, back when I was trying to get interested in magic, there was a store in the mall, and I wanted to go there. And my cousin told me about it when we moved. Uh, we were in Wichita. And the name of the store was Realms of Fantasy. And I told my parents I wanted to go to a store called Realms of Fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, no. my dad was like, he, he had this, I was like, I'm confused. I just want to go to this, this card store, this game store. So we want, next time we went to the mall, I asked if we could go. And he looked over at my mom and said, I'll take him. And so we walked over and he saw what it was. It was just a card store, had tables. It was nothing to it. So <laughs> that was fine. But that's just something that that reminded me of. Nerds who didn't understand what they were naming their shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So you know, Sega like Channel. It. Sega Channel was a big thing, and I'm going to have to look for a message in Discord from a ways back, but you keep going, and then I'm going to have to mute in order to do uh, some more drilling anyway. I uh, maybe think of magic, and like when I got... There was a game I sent, spent a fair amount of time on the 90s on. I really liked it. Was uh, But this was no longer console. We're moving on to PC, but this would have been the uh, Dandelar Magic the Gathering game. Chandelar, I remember. I've read about that. It was a lot of fun. Like, honestly, like, if anyone ever had an interest in, like, oh, I would like to play with, like, the original, you know, cards, the ones that were super powerful, too, like Black Lotus, that's the perfect, I feel like that's the perfect way to play with those cards. Because, like, the game wasn't competitive, right? Like, you weren't playing against other people. It was single player. The AI, the AI could be pretty dumb sometimes. Sure. It was clear that there were certain things that they were scripted to deal with, but there was some times where they just like they didn't know what to do. Um, but like it was kind of fun. It was like a role playing game almost. So, like you'd go around, you'd you know your your combat was like dueling things, and like lots of times the fights would be like really fast because like you know really easy to beat monsters only had like four health to start the game, right? So it's like, but like you got to play with things like dark rituals and stuff like that. Like oh man, like. The best way to win a match was turn one, casting two dark rituals, and then Sanger Vampire. And then turn two, you just one shot the person because they only had four health. <laughs> but, like, uh, you know, you'd build up like currencies and stuff too. And, like, there was the, the dungeons were like the big thing to do. And um, that's where you'd find like the old powerful cards. So that's where you could find like your power nine and stuff like that. And 
um i think demonic tutored because i think the game was based off of fourth edition not revised so a lot of the cards that didn't make it into fourth edition from revised because they were considered too good you know were in these dungeons as well as like stuff from unlimited so um but it, it, that game was a lot of fun that was a lot of fun. And that nice way to play magic too that was like not sweaty at all. Okay, I'm gonna commit a sin here and turn on a vacuum with the mic unmuted, but I want you to listen to this because I remember complaining to you about the fact that I don't have a working vacuum anymore. Okay. So the, the is vacuum gonna work? It's still like it sucks for about two seconds and then it sucks a lot less because it starts to make this really weird noise. Oh, okay. And I don't think I don't know if it works on the floor anymore. It's like I can't I can't afford for more things to break on me right now. Like this is a little bit nuts. Oh, like I, I have no. to go I have to go to the DMV to fucking deregister one of the cars. So because I can't afford to pay to register it for another year and it'll lessen the insurance. And sure, so yeah. it's like I don't wanna aren't vacuums like two hundred fucking dollars. I don't want I don't want to. 200 for, like, oh. baseline ones? It's like, I don't know. Yeah, they're... Maybe you can find, like, really cheap ones, but I would think any really cheap vacuum is going to be a really cheap vacuum. That's my thought. <laughs> but, you know, it's... It's a weird problem to have. Especially right now when I'm actually, like, I'm, I'm doing these house projects and I make it... Like, in the game room, the, pro the project I'm working on in the game room right now requires drilling holes in the walls which means you need a vacuum i that's, that's drywall you don't leave that on the carpet yeah so, uh, so there was a game so the sega channel i have a lot of memories from the sega channel um, this was also about the time a couple years after we got maybe a, just a year after we got the super nintendo we moved back down from Alaska to Kansas. And so that ended up being a time where, okay, now we're all around all of our extended family again. And that included my cousin. Well, cousins, but one in particular who was huge into video games. And I hadn't really been around other people who were really big into video games. We had other people who played games around us up there in Alaska, but they weren't really what people, what the kids were talking about, and we didn't really, you know, I could only think about one pair of brothers that also played video games, and they had games that we didn't. And these days, or, or but honestly, the bigger talk at school those days, up in Alaska, for whatever reason, was wrestling. Because that was, those were the days of, you know, Hulk Hogan and Undertaker oh. and all of that sort of stuff. <laughs> this makes more sense. I was like, really? Kids talking about, like, high school wrestling? Like, Greco Rome? No, no, no. No, no. no. <laughs> this makes way more not, sense. Not the proper yeah. stuff. And I kind of want to make a, a South Park joke right now, but I'm not going <laughs> to. There was, so when I moved down, that, you know, second generation was out. We did not have, we had a Super Nintendo in Alaska, but we did not have Genesis. That was until, but right when we moved down, we were still in temporary housing on base when we finally got, or I don't want to say finally when we got the Genesis. And I remember we went out to the mall, we went back and my, my dad was trying to be as nonchalant as possible about it. So we just walked out of the Sears at the time and he just had it like over on the far side of him and kind of like an underhand claw grip. He just had the box, no bag or anything like that. And I noticed, and right when I started to say something, I started to exclaim very loudly to my brother. He got this, I think both my parents got this smile on their face, like, oh, he's noticed. 
and um but they also still told us like you're not playing it tonight and i don't care if it only takes you one minute to get ready for school you are not playing this before you go to school in the morning so of course all i'm thinking about all night and all of the next day at school was i just want to get home and play sega genesis i just want to get home and play sega genesis <laughs> and that was that was a time that that was a time Oh man! Because the Genesis was not. It came with Sonic, and oh, I gotta mark this. And so it was just, oh, it was a treat. It was such a treat. Um, and then my cousin, I would go over, and that was my first introduction to fighting games. Catch up on chat real quick. Duct tape stream. What do I need duct tape for? This is painter's tape. What do I need duct tape for? Um, my cousin actually was who introduced me to fighting games. And by fighting games at the time, I mean Street Fighter. Mortal Kombat was not out just yet. So, so the very first game that he introduced me to uh fighting game wise was the Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition, I think it was. And so that okay. was the one that it introduced it, you got four new characters plus you were able to play as the bosses from the oh, okay. so like regular. Balrog and Vega and Yeah yeah yeah. And Bison too, I think. Yep. So was Cammy? Uh, yeah. What's his name? Cammy? Was that too early for Cammy? I don't think Fei Long was there I, yet. I don't know if that'd be too early for Cammy or not. I don't, I'll be honest, I don't remember much for Street Fighter Pass when they finally started letting us play it as the boss. Yeah, I did not continue much past this point either. So, he also one of my favorite games and he didn't like it that much he didn't like ever whenever he was like what do you want to play and i would always answer the same thing whenever we went over to his house but there was a game called bonanza brothers and that one i thought was a lot of fun because it was basically you're kind of playing stealth but you're not really stealth but it was just you're you're trying to to, to stun these guards while stealing certain amounts of treasure from this place and you would always escape on the roof to with a helicopter that was a fun game. I picked up a copy since. And then he also, there was Baseball 2020, which was really cool because yeah. unlike our 2020, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> this one had uh, cy you know, humans, cyborgs, and then robot baseball players on a gigantic field. That oh, and the robots could jump like if you timed it right, your robot outfielder or your cyborg outfielder could leap up into the air thirty feet and catch a ball, or more than that. Like you, you didn't really get a scale on this. That was a mm -hmm. fun game. That was a fun game. Uh, but those were console ones I had. So everyone needs duct tape. I do have duct tape. I've got two different colors of duct tape actually. Duck Hunt and those similar games. You don't remember what console. So Duck Hunt was the original Nintendo. Yeah. So Sega Channel, though. Freaking Sega Channel. It was great. It was game streaming. From your cable back in the early 90s. And it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing every month it changed which games you were able to play and you didn't have to download anything because they didn't have hard drives back then you were actually streaming playing the game like it would it might have had a little bit of memory on the unit that you were plugging in but once we got that that kind of became the primary thing we almost never unplugged it to play something else and i have a lot of memories from it a lot of the genesis games i played were only because we had the sega channel but there was one game for years and years and years to the point where I actually went through lists of all of the Super 
uh, all, all of the Sega Genesis RPGs, and I could not find it. I could not be convinced that this was it. And until last year, I was in Taiwan, and I had brought this mini Genesis with me. And I started playing a game called Shining Force. Heard of that. And I get a little bit into it. And I'm sharing memories on a Discord with uh, a couple of friends. And she surprised me. She had played it in her youth, way, way young. And I think it was her first RPG. Another friend of mine wasn't too familiar with it. And after that, well, but I played a little ways into the game until the point where you can kind of start to put a party together. And I got to a certain room. Oh, I made a video of it, not a picture. Dang it. I got to a certain room. And the party members that weren't in my party were in the room. And that was my long lost. So I have it now. I have the game now. Because it's on the mini. So that was a very fun find because to me, that was a ge the thing about the Sega channel, there were no saves. Uh huh. So even if you were playing a game that had a battery backup save, you couldn't save on the Sega channel. So I always had to play, like, I had to get the longest play time I could to go after games like that. So that was that was another Genesis memory, um, and I guess I've got more. But I'll move to the Sega CD after we finish talking about Super Nintendo. So Super Nintendo from you. Oh man, uh, you ever played Act Razor? It was uh, it was like this like RPG slash city builder. It was no. I, I definitely have heard of it. I might have even watched like a video on it, but no. No, I love that one. That was another one that I like. I the thing is, I don't think we ever owned it. Like, I think we rented it, and like, I fell in love renting it, and then like, I kind of forgot about it, or you know, whatever. Like the the rental places went out of business, and um, I don't think I ever reunited with that game again until like early two thousands when I was like, um, just. I needed something to do while I was at school, like, you know, in my downtime. So I started getting, like, any or SS emulators to play games. But, like, uh, yeah, it was, like, a side-scroller but with, like, powering up elements. Like, as you played through the game, you'd get stronger and get more abilities, I think. And then, um, and then you'd, uh, and after every level, there was, like, this part of the game within where you were, had to, like, build civilizations. And it was like Sim City for a bit, and then like you'd get done, and it was always like there's like I was like kind of like two phases, like you you'd defeat some enemy in like a region to kind of free the region at first, and then you'd start building up your civilization there, and then there would be some sort of like bigger bad that you'd have to defeat to sit like to keep the civilization safe, and then you'd move on to the next the next zone. If I remember that correctly, I think that's kind of how it played. That was a fun game. That was back though. I definitely came out. I think when Sim City was new, the idea of like this sort of like, you know, Sim Manager game <laughs> was like just popping up. I did play a fair amount of Sim City as a kid, but not for real. I played Sim City I... two thousand for the Super Nintendo. Was ours? Did it have it? Was it just SimCity? SimCity S. Yeah, ours was just SimCity that we had. So it must have been like the first version. Maybe, but I, I think I might I know. know where you're going with the. But you didn't play it for real. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my brother did. He got pretty far. He almost had the Super Metropolis. I don't. I think he just missed it. Like he just couldn't quite get there. Um, I never had the patience for that. I was still pretty young at that point. So I just did like the scenarios where you're like, now you got to protect your city. And I'm like, yeah, let's turn on every natural disaster. 
<laughs> Bye, <Yep>. city. <laughs> yeah, I did. SimCity 2000 had you had to play a certain map though, so it was always even though they had a lot of maps, or you could even generate new ones. It was always this particular map. And if you did that, and I think you named the file a certain thing, or and you did certain settings or whatever, you would start the game with a million dollars. And my cities oh, would still always fail. So that was still <laughs> a that was still like me trying to figure it out. Like, how do I beat this game? I'm still gonna fail. Right. So, now, like Solaris, like agreed. That agreed. I very much agree with you, Solaris, and that goes into another topic of video game preservation. But we'll get to that. Oh yeah. No, we're moving closer and closer to that uh idea of we don't really get to own anything. It's like it, Well, it, we'll we'll like... get to the unfun stuff. We'll continue continue with your your <laughs> SNES uh Oh um, man. stuff. Trying to go through my SNES game. What else did we have even? I mean, we did play a lot of Street Fighter, but that, you know, it wasn't the multiplayer moving into the multiplayer stuff. Um I did love Mortal Kombat as well. Killer Instinct? Oh, I, I really liked Killer Instinct. I actually got decent at that game. The point where I could do combo breakers and the, the whatever the massive combos and stuff were. Yeah, I remember I remember friends owning Killer Instinct. I never did. To me, it was at that point I was into I had been introduced to Mortal Kombat. And of course, mom said no. Oh yeah, violent. Super oh violent yeah. yeah. <laughs> so for me, Killer Instinct, like I, I was still, I was for whatever reason, the style didn't appeal to me. I was much more interested in, in Mortal Kombat. Whenever I could go to a friend's house that had it, until mom learned that said friend had that game, then we weren't allowed to go there anymore. Oh but, what? But that might have only happened once or twice. But then. Um, and I think for more, for me, I wasn't actually interested in Killer Instinct. I was interested in the I think Jade character. I just wanted more pictures of that 3D character. Yeah. See, I think the thing that drew me into Killer Instinct was full gore. That's what did uh, for a lot of people, probably. Oh man, I, he was so cool. Like I, I was definitely drawn to like just the uh, the aesthetics of him. He was like. A cyborg predator, basically. Come on. But, uh... Oh, that's reminding me of another topic that I first... And I'm about to watch a fucking... Uh... An entire video that's on this movie, but that reminds me of when we did... When I... <laughs> thinking about something entirely different, I was like, what, what's your first on-screen crush? Mm. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was Good like, old. okay, fair, but give me a real life one. And you got angry with me almost, it seemed like, because you're like, but I don't want to give you, I want to give you my answer. <laughs> Good but old Jessica the, Rabbit. I think the point I was bringing it up was just like, dude, I, I need to be talking about real life people for a moment. <laughs> so the. Uh, which made me think, actually, and I can't remember who. Hang on a sec. So my answer for that was Halle Berry and Flintstones. Like, I think that was the first time, I, my, my actual first on-screen crush. But I think I'm, I'm going to continue to say that that's it. But there was someone else I thought of that I think I actually might have liked before that. Because I remember thinking... Like, I thought Kim Basinger and Batman was cute. I was able to recognize that, but it, there wasn't a crush there. So, Solaris, I have not played Spore. I've watched other people play Spore. I have not played Spore myself. Uh, um... No, I forgot. See, these are really the reasons why it's like, I keep thinking of, I keep thinking of it from time to time, but I don't remember exactly who the other previous for on-screen crush might have been. So, let's see. Uh, 
Mortal Kombat, again, parents kept saying no, and then all of a sudden, on a birthday party that was going to be a sleepover for multiple friends and cousins, a gift from my parents was Mortal Kombat 3 for the Genesis. And that was a, a gift in more ways than one. Mom gave the biggest smile. We played that thing all night. All night long. And it was uh, hello. What's up? Oh, no, it's all right. It's just at high water boy in chat. Yep. <laughs> so. That was the first and last night that I played as Striker. Because I just started doing grenade spam and killing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> like, they didn't... That arc was just perfect. And, like, I, if they got close, I would do something to knock them away, use my my nightstick or something, and then I would just grenade spam. And my brother, my cousins, my friends, they all got angry. They're like, you got to pick someone else now. Because they couldn't beat me. They knew what was going on. They couldn't beat me with Striker. So I swapped to Sector. And I played him for the rest of the night. Man, did I even play Mortal Kombat 3? These names don't ring a bell. Did I stop after 2? Long time ago. Mortal Kombat 3. Roster. Okay. Only tried playing Mortal Kombat 11 and almost broke the controller. Yeah, fighting games be like that. <laughs> so maybe I, I kind of remember Cyrax. Yellow one. Show me some images. The name sounds familiar. Yellow, but it's a yellow color. I don't know. Maybe I didn't get into it much. Maybe I just kind of dabbled a tiny bit with it. Oh, okay. Because that Cyrax name sounds so familiar. Yeah, like, I remember that guy a lot. Okay. I must have played it a little bit. When did it release? April of 95? What did it come out on? Was it just on the Sega? No. Arcade, it, Sega. It would have been on the Super Nintendo also. Okay. With uh, sweat instead of blood. Ha! Uh. Nowadays, Nintendo don't give a shit. There was also that... Uh, there was also that... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters. I definitely do not have any memory of that at all. It was a fighting game, but TMNT? Yeah, they went the fighting game route. And the thing is, it was released on three consoles, NES, Super Nintendo, and Genesis. And each of them had a different character, like a, like a different like tenth or whatever character. And that character was on the front, on the cover. So that was interesting. Mushroom thumbstick. This is what you call them because they, I gotta admit, I did not know what you mean by the, I didn't know what you meant by the mushrooms. Now I get it. Now I get it. And you say you didn't like controllers. I get it now. I wonder if like with the MK3, did it come out in arcade first? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they did arcade first and then they got the home releases. Okay. 
back then, way back in then, in the before times, um, where I grew up, there was like a, a mall, and the the mall actually had an arcade, um, called the Wooden Nickel. Yeah, the one that but, was there at that uh, Town East Mall in Wichita was called Aladdin's Castle. I think I still have for arcades. I still have a token or two from it. But yeah, I used to spend a lot of time in that arcade. My my mom was a big fan because there was a in the mall. There was like actually like a little restaurant right next to it. So you know when kids needed to get out, one of the day one of the things she'd do often would just take us there. She'd hang out in the restaurant just having coffee or whatever, and uh, just feed us quarters. We'd spend our time in the arcade. That's another thing that I wish. Uh, I mean, nowadays kids just bring their phones with them everywhere and all kids have them for some reason but um that's one of the things that i wish back when i worked at gamestop a long time ago that you know one of the reasons why i wish arcades still existed was um, at one of the gamestops that i worked at there was this set of uh brothers Actually, it wasn't even... I don't even think they were all brothers. I think two of them were brothers, and then there was another friend that was always hanging out with them. And... Their parents just used GameStop as a daycare. Huh. They would drop them off whenever they were doing grocery shopping. Or just when they wanted some time alone at the house. And they just dropped them off at the GameStop, and they would just hang out there from anywhere from one to three hours. And annoying the shit out of us because we were the ones that they wanted to talk to. Right. Loitering at the GameStop, huh? Loitering. <laughs> oh, man. You know, there's a... There is an arcade, actually, not too far from us now. It's, um... Uh, they had one in... in... Some mall, then they took it back out. I think it's. I'm gonna be honest. It's kind of cheating. It's not like. I mean, it's technically an arcade, but it's also not. Okay. It's downtown. I believe it was called Cobra Arcade. Oh no no no! I've been, I've been. It's the arcade bar. Yes. Yes. The arcade no, I was bar. There, I, I went there years ago. I think it's still there. Yeah, I, I imagine that one actually can survive because you know alcohol. Alcohol. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then you got a nice captive audience, right? Like they're like, "Yeah, I'll go." Because like, you, people go, they'll get drunk, they'll play games, probably blow money on games because they're drunk and they're bad at them. Yeah, but they also had some of the new stuff. Like there's a, I don't know if you were, I mean, probably not because this is a repeated theme with you and I. But there was an arcade release, and by arcade I just mean online only. Uh, okay. Uh, I think it was Pac-Man Championship Edition or something like that. And it really did do a really pretty good job of kind of reinventing. Because what would happen was when you completed it, you didn't complete the stage. The stage did not end. It, like, you would get the last piece, and then you would kind of freeze, and the level would reform. And it would be very shiny, lots of lots of lights, um, lots of graphics, lots of effects, and the ghost positions might change, they might stay the same. And you also would end up having objectives from time to time. It wasn't necessarily eating everything. And they have a sit-down four-player Pac-Man thing there. And that was kind of interesting. I did give that a shot. That was actually pretty interesting. Was it like when you say a sit down four player? Was it like a flat screen that you looked down at? Yeah. Okay. Cause I think I remember something like that from my way back, way way back. Now this would not have been like, uh, well, I mean maybe, but it was um, 
pizza. Oh, they definitely, they definitely, yes. Yes. Dude, Good. it's one of my, that's why I keep looking. I know that there's one on the way to Phoenix. There's one close to uh, Casa Grande. I want to go to a, an actual red roof pizza hut again, because it's been so long. I might want to make a, like, you know, if I, Things get a little bit better. I'll make a trek. I'll make a trek up there specifically just to stop in there, eat a deep dish pizza, and then you know see if they have any arcade games to play too. I would absolutely oh, do that. The uh, we actually have a Red Roof Pizza by us, but they'd have no arcade games in there, which is sad. What? Like, yeah, that was always like, oh man, that was whenever it was always a huge treat if we got to go to Pizza Hut too, and it was like, oh, oh yeah. man, going in there and playing like that. The little, the, the super old arcade games and stuff. Oh, I was so much fun. See, when we were, when I lived in Alaska, my mom worked at one. And so, like, I got to have birthday parties there. Man. Most of the time when we got to go to Pizza Hut, it's because of Book It. We got enough stars on our, <laughs> to get our free okay. personal pan pizza. Okay. Okay. Uh, I also have another memory there. There were some times where, like, you know, Parents weren't able, weren't always able to afford babysitters or anything like that. Because there was also a story like when my when we first went to Alaska, my mom actually got a job at a daycare, and then the daycare went under, and so she actually took a lot of the kids, and we started to have friends at the house, and uh, a bunch of different kids at the house. Then that stopped happening for I guess my mom just got tired of the kids. I don't know. Um, <laughs> or it, it, actually, I think it had to do with the birth of my next brother. So once we hit oh, kid yeah. number three, that's when that stopped. And so, but she still needed a good job. So I actually have a lot of positive memories of, um, we would need of sitting in a room off to the side in the back. And there was a little TV and a little VCR. And we would just watch stuff back there. And I remember watching like Fern Gully back there. Um, I remember there's also another movie that had and I don't know what the name of this movie is if someone else knows please tell me but there was a movie where it had to do with whales that were trying to make a migration and they were fighting off sharks and whatever else but one of the scenes was they were holding their breath and they were traveling and this guy's like I need air I need air I can't I need air and they're like it's not safe there's the black stuff up there, you, you can't do it yet. So he surfaces in oil, because there was an oil spill, because this is one of those movies. And oh, okay. this was after Exxon Valdez. And so he surfaces, can't breathe, because he's covered in oil now, and he suffocates. And this is in a kid's movie. He drowns. Yeesh. Man. No, I don't know what that one was, though. Uh, I don't remember anything like that. I was going to say Free Willy when you said a whale movie, but... No, no, it wasn't Free Willy. The Whale Migration Movie. Cartoon? 90s? Early 90s cartoon. Fly Away Home? No, no. maybe? Not that. No. IMDb rates the eight best whale movies. <laughs> um, nineteen eighty four. So, whale rider, free will. Yeah, these are not. These are not it. Um, let's see, cartoon whale. It keeps wanting to do Samson and Sally, but like, that's a 1984 cartoon. I it could still be it, maybe. And it released in Denmark and Sweden. Samson and Sally revolves around a young albino male sperm whale named Samson, who believes the tales of Moby Dick. Mm, no. Uh, so this was fun. This was fun. No. 
Smart water boy. Just yeah, see so long, this is why I keep this guy around. <laughs> many, yeah, I'm not many, it though. <laughs> many more reasons, but this is one of them. So he can Google <laughs> stuff for me when I'm trying to drill. That's that's what it is. <laughs> anyway, um I'm at a stopping point here. I'm gonna go ahead and say let's pick this up another time. But uh thanks for hanging out. It's about lunchtime for me anyways. So Okay. Yeah, thanks for hanging out. Um this was this was good fun. This was talking about fun stuff while doing work stuff. This was a lot of fun. Dude, yeah, no, it was a good time. Yep, yep. Next time next time I might be playing video games in the background, but we'll Dude, see. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Hopefully one of the ones we're talking about. Oh, you'll be sitting there and be like, what game you play? I'll be like, ah. <laughs> Log out of your live service game and put literally anything else on. How would you put inscription uh, on and tell me about it? Oh my so, God. I'm an act two, I think. <laughs> I can help you with that. Okay. We can do this. So. But, all right, man. All right. Solaris, thanks for the chat. Everybody else, see you guys later. Have a good one. Bye.